If you want to build rapport with teenage clients and learn more about their family and their inner world, I've got a great activity for you that is based on family sculpting and play therapy. I'm going to show you how to do both family sculpting and family portraits because this technique is so versatile. It, you can use it in family therapy, individual therapy, and I have had the best group experiences using this activity. Brace yourself because this video is going to be a bit experiential. After I give you a quick reminder of family sculpting, I'll show you how I generate the process questions that go along with it. And then I'll show you how you can do family sculpting with only one person. This is guaranteed to build that relationship up if you're working with teenagers. They love nothing more than to talk about their family, but only if you find the right way to do it. If you want more videos like this, more techniques, more skills, hit subscribe to this channel. And if you're a therapist in particular, join the mailing list because I will be sending out a bunch of freebies, handouts, activities, uh, and all kinds of things that you might like to use with your clients. And if you don't know me, my name is Oliver Drakeford. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in West Hollywood. I'm a certified group psychotherapist and I ran a residential treatment center for teenagers. This whole idea came about during COVID when I was the clinical director of a teen residential facility. And I was trying to come up with ways to do family sculpting online. Before COVID, I would have these immensely powerful sessions using family sculpting techniques with families in the same room, in groups of families in the same room, and uh, just groups with teenagers. And side note, you can totally adapt this activity to almost any format. I've had great results when individual family members make up their own portraits and share it with each other. Um, I've, I've done it in groups, I've done it in multi-family groups. It's a great, great technique. I mean, literally everyone was crying. Family sculpting is an incredible exercise where you use people in the group or real members of the family, if it's a family therapy session, to create a living sculpture that reflects a subjective experience that the client has of their family. Forgive my dodgy editing capabilities, but if I was working with a family or a group, uh, it might look something like this. I'd ask the person who volunteered to sculpt their family, and we're normally going with the IP, um, to think about who in the group they're going to get to play each family member. Obviously, if this is a family, they're probably going to pick dad to play dad and the sibling to play the sibling. Um, but if it's a group of teenagers, I'm curious who they pick and why, and I might process that later. First of all, I ask where they would like to position themselves in the sculpture and remind them that they have the whole space to use. And I say space instead of room because occasionally some bright spark will want to put dad outside of the office, which I actually let them do for a few minutes until the point is made. And then I bring whoever it is back inside so they can hear the session and participate. So the client or the IP decides where in the room they want to be. And then I ask them what they will be doing in their sculpture. Because this is a sculpture, we can position ourselves to do whatever we want. And this teen in this particular made up exercise is, uh, says he's gonna be on the floor, on his phone, or just feeling depressed. So next I ask the teen who they want to position next. And again, I'm kind of curious about the order in which they pick family members. In this example, they pick dad, who they uh, positioned by the window and he was instructed to be reading a book or looking out the window and uh, not to pay attention to anyone else. The next person they wanted to sculpt was an older sibling. And they wanted them very close to dad, but not on the same level. So the instructions were that the sibling was to be sat down on the sofa trying to get dad's attention. And finally, this client positioned mom on the coffee table, staring down at their sibling, yelling about homework. So I use props whenever I can. Um, so you can see dad reading some random magazine that was in the waiting room. And mom is holding a copy of the DSM-4 because that was the closest thing that I could think about that looked like a textbook. This is supposed to be fun and spontaneous. So if you model things like getting excited about props and ideas, it rubs off and you will find that the family is super engaged uh, faster than when you play it straight and serious. 
the last thing that I do is to pull the IP or whoever's sculpting the family off to the side to get as much perspective uh, as possible. So in my office, it's the other side of the camera looking that way. And we stand all the way back there and I will ask them if it feels right. If they want to change anything or tweak anything, I'll let them do that and remind them that this is their sculpture and they get to be in charge and it has to feel like an accurate representation of, um, you know, what, what they're feeling about their family. So we just created a family sculpture. Easy. In my mind, the next job that I have to do is come up with some interpretations about what I'm seeing, which I may or may not share with the family, depends what it is but it certainly will guide my questions and my interventions. So making interpretations for the family sculpture and family portraits requires a certain skill and some knowledge that you have if you've done a master's program and have some experience. However, I'm not entirely sure how to teach this other than by example. And I have found in my experience that the therapists that I've trained in residential treatment settings and in my private practice, as well as the non-clinicians, the clinical support staff, the technicians, all picked this up very, very quickly and um, to the point where they were offering interpretations and suggestions and ideas that I hadn't thought of. So this is to say that you'll get the hang of this pretty quickly after a few examples, which we're about to do. Let's talk about positioning, and this is a great example. So although the show was called The Flintstones, I think every episode at least in my recollection, was about Fred. And you needn't have watched a single episode to know that this might be a probability. So had I not known anything about this family, I would be wondering why Fred is in the middle and the centre of attention. And whose idea was it that everybody be giving him these looks of absolute adoration? I mean, even the dinosaur is giving him some love right there. Can someone remind me, was Fred Flintstone a narcissist? I mean, this is kind of ruining my childhood here. The next theme that I'm looking for is about closeness. And full disclosure, I googled awkward family portraits to find this image. So I don't know if it's real, I don't know if it's photoshopped, um, but, but either way, what stands out to me in this picture is how chaotic it feels. Everyone is looking in different directions, or certain people aren't looking where they're supposed to be looking, like behind the camera or off to the side. And I, I'm not sure if somebody's been distracted and there's something going on behind the camera or if it was meant to be like this. I think this family really wanted to be portrayed as being close to each other, which is reflected in someone's decision or insistence that everyone wear brown. If this were a real client, I might be wondering about leadership and how disorganized they are. And I'd want to compare this photo with my experience of them uh, in, in the room or in sessions and what they've said. And again, I'm not going to base any final decisions on a photo alone. I'm going to make sure there's backup in what they tell me and how they present and the intake. The next theme that comes up is symmetry and it's probably very unfair to compare this family to the Obamas, but I'm going there. And I'm immediately struck by some symmetry. Almost everyone is at the same eye level, it feels, and there's the same color scheme going on. Um, everyone's in black and white, everyone is smiling. This feels balanced, organized, it feels happy. It's, it's just pleasing to look at. So this is the experiential part. I'm gonna throw some images up at you and my favorite questions to ask myself and other people in groups when I'm trying to process reactions are, what do you notice? What do you feel? And what are your associations? So these are the questions I would love for you to be thinking about when the next image goes up. And I would love to know what your answers are. So feel free to put them in the comments below um, and I'll give you some feedback, especially if it's something that, you know, I don't mention in this video or you think I haven't noticed. All right, so here's that next portrait. Again, I did Google awkward family portrait, so I have no idea if this is real or staged or photoshopped. But the interpretation that really came to mind is more of a question about whether dad is a flight risk. To me, it looks as if most of the family members are trying to weigh him down or pin him down. Are they afraid he's going to leave or run away or float off? 
there's something about this that really stood out to me. If a family had sculpted this in my office or in a multi-family group that I was running, I would want to know how dad feels in that position. Does he feel suffocated? Does he feel held back? It wouldn't actually surprise me if his answer at first was that he liked it or he loved being at the center of the portrait and loved being close to his uh, children. A bit like Fred Flintstone, maybe. In the moment, I would take his answer at face value, but I suspect that this might be a defense. And later on in treatment, he would reveal feelings that are a little bit opposite to that. And that's because I'm thinking of family systems and uh, Murray Bowen's idea that there are two opposing and contradictory forces of togetherness and separateness. And I think that this might be reflected in this family portrait. The togetherness aspect is represented by everyone wearing blue denim and trying to look like one cohesive family unit. And the idea I have about dad wanting to run might reflect his unconscious desire that the family um, is holding him back. And there's some expression of him wanting to be an individual and autonomous. Again, I just want to remind you to be careful what you offer to the family. It can't just be based on a photo or a sculpture. It has to be backed up with your knowledge of the family that you've gained through the intake process or um, from talking to colleagues if you're in a residential treatment centre. Um, or perhaps if you're a structural family therapist, you, you've observed some enactments and you've got uh, feedback from previous sessions. The family's responses to my questions or my interpretations will either start to solidify my hypothesis or force me to go back to the drawing board and create a new hypothesis. And this is the beauty of working, you know, a little bit strategically and structurally. Um, I don't hold my hypotheses very closely. I'm ready to throw them away if they don't work. I'm happy to be proven wrong as much as I am to be proven right. So this final family portrait is really quite sad once you apply the skills and techniques that we've just looked at in the past examples. Of course, I might be a little bit biased because I'm British or perhaps I'm, I just know how the story ends or I've been watching too much of The Crown, but I can't help but notice how sad this image is. And your footsteps will always follow greenest hills Your candles burned out long before Your legend ever will Right, it seems to me that Princess Diana is almost in the background. She is almost sitting behind King Charles, taking up less space than him and shrinking into the background. It really doesn't look like she's enjoying being there. I mean, both of her kids are playing with her husband or at least on her husband's side. While someone somewhere decided she should sit in the back with the dog. It kind of looks like she's the nanny. Meanwhile, now King Charles is going for dad of the year and it kind of looks like he is the source of all joy and happiness. Uh, in his kids and it insinuates that Diana is the spare part. And if you're not up with British royalty or history, then what we know from various sources is that this was her experience from the start of the relationship. She was made to feel very unwelcome. It was a bit of an arranged marriage compared to the portrait of the Obamas. It's a very different photo. Even when you just look at the symmetry, it's vastly different. If I were to summarize how to interpret photos like this or sculptures, I think how I do it is to ask myself, what do I see? And what might that mean about the family and the family structure? I'm also thinking quite abstractly. Um, as you might have picked up on with my comments about the denim clad family, um, with dad being tied down or held down. Comments like that comes from zooming out and perhaps looking at what the whole image is saying. What is the story that's being conveyed, not by individual people, but by the whole image? So I encourage you to think outside the box when you're working this way. 
if you're going to say any of these things to the family, you might want to position it as a reframe. And this is a structural family systems technique. Um, and the goal would be to offer a differing image of how you see the family so they might start to think differently about themselves. It's a little confrontational, but it's just the seed of planting that things might be different. So instead of saying, wow, dad, it looks like you're about to run away there. I might say, it seems that this family really needs dad. Or I might say directly to dad, um, this family really wants you to know how important they are to them. How does it, how does it feel to be so wanted? So I'm just planting the seeds that there's something to think about for the family. Okay, so back to the sculpture in my office. The problem, obviously, with trying to show you a sculpture in video format is that you don't get a sense of all of the dimensions that you would in person. So when I was creating this, I tried to use height um, in the recreation by placing one family member on the coffee table and another on the floor. You might also get a sense of the distance, but it's not quite the same as doing it in person. Regardless, I think you should use height make people stand on things or sit them down on the floor it makes it more involved although this was a made-up example i do hope that you can still pick up on a few themes and you might be able to make an interpretation or two regardless of how limited we are using video these are some of the headings that i think might guide your interpretation or your thinking number one i'm thinking about distance closeness number two i'm thinking about uh, eye contact, or at least who is facing who and who is facing away. Height, I already mentioned, who's elevated and who is on the floor. So number four, what is the picture showing? Um, are there any themes? Is there a sort of um, message being shown in the image as a whole? And uh, number five is about symmetry and distribution. Are people closer together and other people further away? Are they evenly spaced out? Are they all together? Um, number six is touch or contact. Sometimes I'm curious about who's touching who and who isn't. Okay, so when it came to distance, I noticed obviously that dad and the IP are furthest away. Dad is also not making eye contact with anyone, but also neither is the IP. I wonder if that means that they have something in common. Mum is taking up the most space. She's in the middle. She's the most elevated, she's the highest person. I don't know what that means, I'm going to ask. So there are two disconnected family members, dad and the IP, and the sibling and mom taking up most of the room. The IP is also outside the center of attention. They're sort of, it's all about the sibling and mom and dad. So my conceptualization is something about the louder sibling is getting all of the attention and the IP is feeling very left out, unsupported or neglected. And this is actually quite common when one child goes to residential, just because um, they're making the most obvious signs of distress doesn't mean that the younger siblings aren't suffering. Another side note, sorry, this is one of the reasons why I insist that the whole family attend family sessions or family day when I was running um, family day in residential. We don't want the IP to switch from one sibling to another. That means that we haven't done our job. So our job is to treat the whole family regardless of who's carrying the symptoms. So going back to this sculpture, I'd make a comment somewhere that mum and dad are not working together. Mum might be over-functioning, doing the cleaning, the cooking, then going to work, then picking the kids up and then making sure they do their homework while dad looks out of the window and reads. This might be a marital skew that needs to be addressed. This, this could be representative of something else going on in their marriage that needs to be unpacked. It's very important that I bring that one up. So I might offer the interpretation or reframe that it looks like the sibling here is trying to get mum and dad closer. They're literally calling dad in to be closer and uh, with not doing the homework, mum is also drawn to that person. And certainly this happens a lot in family therapy. The IP literally brings mum and dad together at least for an hour in a session. Interpretations aside, how do you process this? Well, the most powerful experiences I created when doing family sculpting was by bringing in a bit of psychodrama. And don't get scared, it's, it's kind of fun and not that big of a deal. The easiest way to do this would be to get certain family members of your choice to describe 
what it feels like to be where they are positioned. Remember, they didn't choose to stand there. The IP put them there. So I might ask dad to describe what he saw from out of the window and follow it up with something like, and how connected do you feel to your family right now? Whenever there are two people close together and there's a big height difference, I want them to swap places. Um, so I would have mum sit on the sofa, look up at the sibling who's now playing mum and describe her feelings. And I imagine she might say something like she feels small or intimidated or look down on something like that might come out. I would ask the sibling then, have you ever felt like that when mum is positioned over you like this? And I suspect that will get an emotional reaction if, um, if it hits. I would have mum or dad or the sibling swap places with the IP and describe what it feels like down there. And again, I'd imagine they'd use the words lonely or disconnected. Um, this is a really valuable lesson in empathy and it's an experiential lesson in empathy, right? We're, we're literally trading places with each other. Another trick that I use is to have a family member come and stand next to me, again, just behind the camera there, and look back at the sculpture and describe out loud what they see. For some reason, when I look at this, I would be pulled to have the sibling come out and describe it. Um, and if I need to go and substitute my body for where the sibling was sitting while they stand up there, I would totally do that. I think their perspective is gonna be really interesting I'm, I want them to be able to tell the truth about what they see. This is again about some empathy. Um, there's literal perspective taking and uh, having the family talk to each other in ways that I can almost guarantee that they don't right now. We're, we're sort of getting a bit into personal or encouraging them to talk about what it feels like or what they imagine someone else feels like. This is new stuff for, the, for this family. I think I'm going to put a part two of this technique and this whole idea together and I have some ideas on how to deepen things. Um, there's a, a technique that I use about looking into the future and redoing the sculpture. So I want to encourage you again, hit subscribe to the channel and most importantly, if you're a clinician, I send out freebies and downloads and exclusives and all kinds of things on www.mypeoplepatterns.com forward slash clinicians. I'm pretty sure someone somewhere is asking, how the hell do you do anything like this when you're working with a teen individually or doing family therapy online or seeing a teen online doing therapy with them? Well, you get the IP, you get your client to make a family portrait. And thankfully, you don't need any pens or pencils or art skills at all. <laughs> what I do have though is I have my client pick images to represent each family member and themselves. For those of you who aren't so psychodynamic or psychoanalytic, the unconscious is influencing all of these decisions. The client might consciously choose an image of a wolf because it looks cool, but also unconsciously they might choose it because they feel like a lone wolf or they want to belong to a pack. If they pick this for someone else, I might wonder if the person that they chose it for is a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, um, these are just all associations coming to my mind around the word wolf. And you get to play with these things, see if it fits. If you want to offer it to the client, do so. And if they don't agree with it, great. I think your unconscious is also working here, is pulling in things that you noticed from the intake, from meeting the family, from what has been said in other sessions and is also putting things together to throw up to your brain. So work with it. I have a bunch of different ideas for cards for you. I love this interactive set. You can get it on Amazon, but it's very literal, like an angry man or a worried lady. If you want to go more boo-boo with me and explore this whole unconscious abstract thinking thing, um, there's there's better images. My go-to is random images that I pulled from Unsplash or some other free photo sharing site. And I've also found this deck of cards on Etsy, which are quite interesting. They're all very vague and, um, you know, weird enough to be able to generate some interpretive conversations around. 
once they've chosen all the cards for each family member, I show them this image of uh, concentric circles and ask them to imagine they're a dot in the middle of the innermost circle and they're going to position other family members around them until it feels right. So this is just like family sculpting, right? They place the images wherever they want on the canvas or the space. I sometimes use a coffee table, so, you know, it doesn't have to be pen and paper or a wall. If they would rather not put themselves in the middle, that's totally fine. There's not really many ways you can mess this up. So go with the flow, see what happens. I've had numerous clients want to pick multiple pictures for each family member. And I kind of roll with that. Sometimes I process it, sometimes I don't. Um, go for it. It's play. So I let them play. Just remember, it does take longer to explain things if they're going to talk about each card. So be aware of time. If your client asks about distance and what it means, sometimes I tell them um, that it can reflect how close emotionally you feel to someone. But for the most part, I think the less you say, the better, the more authentic it will be. Um, you just kind of have to judge that for yourself. When they're done, I'll have them take one more look at it and ask them to see if the relationships between other people feel right. So this often prompts some shifting of the diagram to reflect that mum and dad need to be closer or further apart or a sibling needs to be closer to mum. And I remind them again that it has to feel right to them. There's no right or wrong answer. So they move it around until you're ready or they're ready and then you get interpreting. This is my translation of the family sculpture that we did earlier into a portrait. And I think some of the same dynamics are present. What you miss in positioning and actions that each person played, you kind of, well, you might make up for with image choice. This portrait doesn't have the client in the middle and it's totally okay because really I'm just imagining that the concentric circles move down to uh, a little lower corner. Or perhaps the client thought of the image with the sibling in the middle, in which case I might ask who is the center of attention in your family. Aside from the dynamics and distance and positioning, I would ask what each card means. Why did you, what does this image me mean about you? The unicorn kitten thing is very popular with teenagers that feel left out or weird or different or um, neglected. So I would imagine an answer like that coming from this teenager who really feels left out. Um, the siblings, the boxer and, you know, starting fights, that kind of makes sense. He might portray mum as the superhero because she fixes everything and does everything. The castle is a really interesting one. And my associations to it are it's kind of cold and solid and impenetrable. And if that doesn't come out of the client naturally, I might share that with the client, see if it fits. Yeah, dad does feel very closed off. Remember in the sculpture, he was facing away from the whole family. And I wonder if he's got a wall up or a castle wall up. So I think what you can get from this activity is priceless. The client can show you how they feel about their family and all of the relationships within the family. Some, remember some clients can't really describe things using words or they're not so good at describing their inner experience and it's much easier for them to depict things using what is essentially play therapy. They're able to show things around in a way that isn't playing with little dolls. All right, I do hope you enjoyed this and got something valuable out of it. Uh, I could go on for hours, but uh, I'll try and limit myself. I do have enough thoughts and experience and stories to tell to make another two or three videos about this. So if you're interested in learning more, let me know, hit subscribe, send me an email, or leave a comment. Um, and I do hope you let me know if you use this, how it goes. I'll be sending out some downloads if you join the mailing list. So make sure you hit subscribe to our mailing list and you'll get them.